Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm very happy to welcome you today for, the, for another lecture in the frame of the Expanding Academy. <coughs> and today we have two very special guests, Alon Schwabe and uh, Daniel Fernandez Pascual, cooking section that since 2013 are investigant <coughs> are, <coughs> oops, are, um, are examining the, 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 um, the systems that uh, are organizing the world through food and they are also researching very much on, poli on, on food politics, how they are trans uh, transforming the landscapes and also how they're impacting the climate change today. <coughs> And um, <laughs> uh, Alan and uh, Daniel have, uh, uh, are using very much uh, the site, resp uh, site responding installations, video and performance, and they are extending uh, different fields in this way also, uh, architecture, art, ecology, and geopolitics. And <coughs> they were collaborating with, very, with many, many different institutions and mu <coughs> museums all over the world participating in biennials and festivals. You can go on the, on the website and see uh, in detail with uh, which uh, institutions they have collaborated. Exhibiting uh, the one of the last uh, shows that they have realize, realized a solo show with Tate Britain. And currently they are uh, preparing a big solo show also with Bonniers Kunsthalle in Stockholm. They have been granted very much with important prizes like uh, the Visible Award in 2019, uh, the, the uh, Future Generation Prize, Art Prize, the Wheelwright Prize, and also, not, uh, at least also now in the last edition of the uh, nominators as finalists in the, in the Turner Prize, where they have developed a very beautiful project also because they convinced 21 uh, museums to uh, remove uh, the, from, the, from their menus the, the salmon and to introduce uh, the, the, the climate of our dishes that they will now a little bit explain better what it is. And uh, today we have invited them <coughs> and have the pleasure that they present us Climavor, a project that uh, investigates how to eat as humans are changing uh, the climates. And uh, this, it's a project that started in 2015 in uh, uh, Scotland, in Island of Skye, together with uh, the institution Atlas Arts. And it's a very interesting process, long-term project they are developing there that is taking very, very different formats not only the, 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 the on-site uh, uh, practice, but it's also taking very different formats as exhibition conferences and performances that are then going in the museums. And uh, they are proposing, they're quite an amazing uh, new uh, ecosystem because they are proposing a different way also to, to produce and to, to live there in, uh, in, in alt an alternative to the intensive, unsustainable farming of salmons. So they're developing there a really uh, an, in an interesting model of living uh, that uh, with a completely different way of producing and uh, consuming. So I give the floor now to Alan and Daniel. I'm very happy that they are here. So have a good presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, and thank you everyone for coming. This is like really exciting. I think it's the first time we're presenting in front of an audience for <laughs> two years. So this is going to be fun. And for tonight, we uh, structure the presentation in two parts. The first part will talk about color and the colors of the climate emergency. And then the second part will be speaking more specifically about the ongoing project in sky it has been like almost six years seven years um, and how the two connect so we can start oranges require orange to be they are a color expectation if an orange is not orange it is no orange oranges originated in China where they were crossbred from a mandarin and a pomelo as early as the fourth century from there Oranges passed from Sanskrit through Persian and its Arabic derivative, Naranj. Traveling the, with the Moors, Naranjas soon dotted Al-Andalus and Sicily. 
Oranges arrived in Italy, in England from France in the 14th century, their bright skin holding a taste of a color that became popular in markets, in, on palettes, and eventually in tongue. For centuries, oranges were orange, and still orange was not a color. It was called yellow-red. It took another 200 years for the color to earn its name, to become a form that could give itself to others and to be ascribed to flowers, to stones, minerals, and the setting sun. To the West, oranges followed the path of Spanish missionaries to America and led their name to Orange County and the Orange State. In California, the fruit fed the miners of the gold rush who passed through mission towns. In Florida, there were so many groves that by 1893, the state was producing five million boxes of fruit each year. In this tropical climate though, nights too humid and too hot, oranges would ripen too quickly. They were ready to be eaten while still green. And so, from the 20th century onwards, green oranges have been synthetically dyed orange, coated to match consumer expectation. Oranges reveals that humans cannot imagine a species detached from its color, even when we are the ones who detach it. This is the origin of what Aihisano calls the capitalism of the senses, the management of food color as a business practice often invisible to consumers in order to correct the natural variations. As she remarks, the color of food is not merely a psychological characteristic, but the contested terrain where nature and technology intersect. Business interests, government regulation, and consumer expectation compete, and taste and sight are intertwined. Amid all the observations that are made about industrialization and its consequences, the, the following is rarely heard. The world's colors are shifting. We grew up coloring pictures of the world. Trees are green, oceans blue, yolks are yellow and that everything else in life is turned regularly upside down um, is only tolerable because oranges remain orange and the sky remains blue. But an increasing amount of industrial energy is directed, therefore, towards dyeing the world in natural colors so that life and commerce may proceed. But dyes may miss their mark. Shifting cues in flesh, scales, skin, leaves, wings and feathers are clues to the environmental and metabolic metamorphoses around and inside us. The force that is color is not for domestication. It is fugitive. Color colors outside our lines. As Esther Leslie puts it, color is fragile and contingent. Color is fleeting, fugitive, unstable, more attuned to the memory than to the objective world, always escaping or seeping away fading as night falls or when the sun shines too brightly. Chemists struggle to make it last. Color is motile. And in the realm of color, chemical color, synthetic color, nothing remains the same as it was yesterday. In 2018, an eye-catching sparrow was spotted on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. The sparrow was bright pink. We know what sparrows are supposed to look like because they have evolved with us. Over several millennia, food scraps from human settlements attracted sparrows from the wild, which mutated into new species. House sparrows have since become a familiar sight wherever humans dwell. They metabolize the shades of our settlements into their brown gray feathers. They are drabber than their older tree sparrow cousins who preserve the brighter tones of the forest. The pink sparrow, neither forest nor house, was a color leak. The sparrow had turned salmon. Salmon are at home in color. Whipping her tail, a female salmon spends two days making a depression in the riverbed called a red, where she deposits her eggs. Fertilized, these red spheres of nutrients encase young salmon, who eat their way out taking the color inside. Once the eggs are depleted, salmon swim to the ocean in search of food. There, they feed on red-pink crustaceans, mostly shrimp and krill, as well as small fish and even smaller crustaceans in their digestive systems. 
From these, they absorb yellow, red, orange, fat soluble pigments called carneton car carotenoids. The tint, salmon, salmon. Salmon record their location by metabolizing these uh, shades. Their flesh is actually color coordinated with their journey. If salmon could peer inside their own bodies, they could distinguish from their muscle tones the Trondheim Fjord from Sky or the Bering Sea along the route. When salmon are ready to breed, they stop eating. Their stomachs shrink to the size of a finger to make room for roe and milt, and they are drawn back to their birthplace, searching for home against the current. The swim upstream requires such exertion uh, of energy also that it pushes red pigment to the surface of a salmon's skin, a sign of health that lures mates. Females um, pass on carotenoids in their flesh to plump their row and make it attractive for uh, prospective males. Color then streams through generations linking salmon to their red. Salmon color is the pathway, both metabolic and geographic, of being. It is the atmosphere in which salmon are born and die. Color in this cosmos then is more than cosmetic. It is a biological influence as strong as memory. Salmon is a means by which color moves according to the logic of ingestion. Salmon metabolize their color, literally drawing life from it, and human, craving this color species, consume an image of health. Such is the human thought of salmon. Scales encasing ink perfect pink flesh, a river leaping with fish on the run, a color bound to a body and a body bound to its own name. On the Isle of Skye, however, this pictorial logic is fading because the sky no longer runs salmon. Populations have fallen to historic lows as corporate aquaculture has filled the waters of uh, the island with intensive open net salmon farms. Salmon, both the color and the fish, is a red herring. Open net fish farms are flow through feedlots. Enclosed in pens with one to 200,000 other fish, a salmon cannot feed on krill and shrimp. Here, a salmon is naturally deprived of astaxanthin, the carotenoid that makes cr crustaceans pink and protects its body from so solar radiation and stress. A salmon's color reflects its well-being. Darker pink salmon represents access to astaxanthin-rich crustaceans, whereas pale pink salmon represents a lack of nutrients or high stress levels. Farmed salmon lacking these resources are no longer truly salmon. Their flesh tone is now closer to white gray than red. Salmon the fish are cleared of salmon the color. Pigmentation in farmed salmon also profits from being photo manipulated. Consumer demand requires fish all year round and so many farms in northern latitudes mask the seasons through artificial light. Fluorescents, mimicking summer sunshine, are turned on and off. On and off. On and off. On and off. And on and off. Most salmon do not know seasonal darkness in their brief 18 months of captive life before slaughter. So 100 lumen bulbs are an ingredient in a lighting recipe that creates unseasonal summer-like atmospheres underwater. For farmed salmon, a year then might have two summers and a skip a winter. Under the weight of accelerated growth, farmed salmon spins, spines curves, eyes wraps, tails shorten and jaws bend. More than 90% of farmed fish can indeed be consumed, considered deformed. Fused and compressed, vertebra twist bodies to such an extent that salmon struggle to swim. Parasites, like sea lice, thrive on salmon bodies when they are cramped into the confines of the pen, easily multiplying as they jump between hosts. These parasites feed on the skin and blood of farmed salmon, causing lesions, stress, and in some cases, killing entire populations. The lesions, which make fish aesthetically unappealing and unmarketable, are the biggest problems for farms. Increasingly, Poisonous toxins to fight disease and parasites are added to the feeds and metabolized into flesh. But when chemicals are ineffective, salmon are splashed with boiling water over short periods of time to detach the lice from their flesh. 
and this is an imprecise method. In 2016, over 175,000 Scottish salmon were boiled alive during a not uncommon accident. Another way to target parasites is through the use of laser beams. These optical Dalosian devices go on and off, on and off, on and off, and on and off. The farm's light regime, therefore, is a paradox. As growing seasons extend and fish multiply, parasites thrive, and more light enters the fray. Light necessitate light to keep up with market speed. Salmon summer is also the season for cataracts. Warm water temperatures fog the lenses of fish eyes, and usually salmon swim deeper to escape the heat. But in farms, since there is no place to go, this is what happens to their eyes. In this salmon world, most fish then are blind and partially deaf, which at least may reduce the stress of living in the noisy light systems, heaters, and sealed, sealed deterrents from the farm. 100 of kilos of feed, particles, and antibiotics, which are distributed through hyper-efficient automated feeders that detect when the fish are hungry, below out into the surrounding water. Clouds of fish excrement sink and blanket the seafloor, stiffening oxygen and creating uninhabitable dead zones. Chemical runoff of these toxic toilets leads to disease and mutations in surrounding fish populations. Salmon farms now dot the coasts of Scotland, Iceland, Chile, Ireland, Canada, and Tasmania. But they also affect the waters of lands of other countries, from South America to West Africa. Trawlers off the coast of Peru or Senegal, which sustainably source anchovies for feed pellets, are depleting local fish populations. These anchovies are mixed with soy protein from Brazil's Cerrado tropical savanna, which is being cleared of farmland for farmland at the rate 50% faster than the Amazon. When the Scottish clearances happened some 200 years ago, thousands of Gael people were dispossessed, evicted from their villages, and banned from uh, living off the land as they used to. Sheep became more valuable than people. Today, salmon farming corporations are replicating a similar process by clearing the seabed, um, and as more and more dead zones are appearing all around salmon farms. And this new wave of oceanic clearances is a multi-billion uh, business for a few, but invisible to many humans above water. Salmon are bred to be hungry. Their job is to put on weight at any cost. What's more, we should rather consider the act of feeding salmon as a landscape consuming practice at a planetary level. As a global commodity, farmed salmon defies any attempt to be pinned down to any particular geography. Scottish salmon today does not entirely come from Scotland. Salmon Hatching Row is part of an intricate transnational network of precious genes uh, with colored pigments and eggs fertilized and incubated in different facilities and ready to be sent from farming site to farming site to farming site across the world. Therefore, Scottish salmon today is neither entirely Scottish, nor is it wholly salmon. An inventive marketing around the origins and quality of farmed salmon has been uh, emerging in the UK. The Scottish Salmon Company has branded themselves as purveyors of authentically Scottish salmon. Despite being registered in Jersey, owned by a Swiss bank with Ukrainian and Norwegian investors, floated on the Oslo Stock Exchange, and used imported Norwegian genetic material for their farmed salmon. Greek seafood Hjeltland sources salmon from the wild waters of Shetland, but wild here refers only to the water and not the fish itself. It is no surprise then that Marks and Spencer salmon brand name is Loch Muir. Indeed, a Scottish wilderness sounding name, but Loch Muir is a place that does not exist on the map. Aldi promotes best of a Scotland salmon with an image of a fishing boat when it is actually farmed in Norway and the Faroe Islands. Morrison promotes catch of the day salmon, which is sourced from farms in Norway and Scot Scottish quality salmon, which is farmed in Norway, but only smoked in Scotland. So Scottish salmon has become a brand that um, needs to be critically rethought, not only from an environmental or ecological perspective, but also questioning what Scottish and salmon mean in that construction. Salmon is a species cleared of the metabolic process that constitutes salmon, both color and fish. 
it is our desire for color which eventually landscapes the, landscapes the environment. In natural habitats, animals use color to attract warm or camouflage. The absence of a color indicates sickness, a body removed from the social functions of an ecosystem. In captivity, where mating is replaced by artificial insemination and predators by disassembly lines, most color fades. Yet to the human eye, a body without a color is no body. So if food lacks color, or the body lacks the food that contains its color, then the body needs to be color fed. The equation feed conversion ratio is a tool to quantify the success of salmon. It indicates the precise quantity of feed pellets, around three kilos, that equate in biomass gain, which is around one kilo. And it is that efficiency ratio by which feed is best converted into food and color. These animals, which are neither beings nor objects, are the synthesis of ecology and economy. Living matter then becomes a dislocated liquid volume cascading through planetary pipes that connect oceans with disassembly lines, mills with packing facilities. So chicken are fed ground up fish, fish are fed ground up chicken, and pigs and fish are fed ground up fish. Millions of tons of animal travel the world as animal feed. And in every step, color additives supplement the food deficiencies of each industrialized species, coloring the flesh that flesh ingests. Feed is not just food whether for humans or animals. It's a logistical operation that transfers matter from place to place and body to body. Dying and digesting bodies become color machines that process and propagate images of their wilderness, the fashioning of which they no longer control. The pink sparrow in sky appeared at the end of one of these voracious food chains. Its salmon feathers were actually a color leak, a sign. In farms, the color salmon actually lives outside the fish. Gray salmon must be fed an imitation of their natural color. Farmers cannot afford to feed salmon, krill, or baby lobsters, and so since the 1970s, synthetic astaxanthin has been used to stain salmon in multiple pantones of salmon. At once gray and pink, they are salmon. 15 hues classify salmon following 15 Panton shades. You are looking at Panton 1555U. Are looking at Panton 1565U. Are looking at Panton 1625U. Are looking at Panton 1635U. Are looking at Panton 1575U. Are looking at Panton 487U. Are looking at Panton 486U. Are looking at Panton 1645U. Are looking at Panton 157U. Are looking at Panton 1655U. Are looking at Panton 158U. Are looking at Panton 1665U. Are looking at Panton 485U. Are looking at Panton 2347U. Are looking at Panton 2028U. Are looking at the 15 pantones of salmon. The salmon fan is a universal system used by the salmon industry to apply synthetic salmon tones to fish. Darker hued salmon, fed more astaxanthin, are more expensive than lighter shades, while salmon lower than the 23 on the scale are difficult to sell at any price. This salmon palette was invented by Hoffman Laroche and after decades of producing food coloring and medicines derived from petrochemicals, La Roche took a special interest in synthetic astaxanthin in the 1990s. Their Samofan, a trademark, uh, is a scale that actually allows salmon farms to decide the precise amount of astaxanthin to feed the fish uh, according to the tastes of the market. In 2002, La Roche sold Samofan together with their vitamins and fine chemicals divisions to Dutch state mines, um, which was originally set up as a coal mining company. And today, DSM markets synthetic carotenoids as nutritional products for salmon and shrimp under the trade name of Carophile Pink. Humans taste with their eyes just as much as with their tongues. And in DSM's own words, Color is essential to the sensory perception of quality. Salmon, the color, the flesh, the fish, the system, is an, an image produced by an independent and dependent on generic geographies. We paint the world in colors we expect to see, and in so doing, we color our own expectations. 
yet salmon struggle to achieve the perfect salmon salmon that consumers demand in their flesh, even if with the aid of synthetic coloring. Their color is affected by the level of anxiety, exhaustion, and crowding in the farm. And these stresses create their given color by reducing the metabolization of astaxanthin. Homogeneity in color among salmon, even in the same farm, is actually almost impossible, so faulty colors appear. At the time of slaughter, 10 to 30% of salmon have black spots in their muscle fillet, a sign of tissue damage. No one wants to eat fish colored with polka dots, and so they are discarded. Color is all that matters. The salmon sparrow and sky was a warning signal of this very possibility, a body consumed by the color of another species, a red flag. In 1856, William Perkins was trying to synthesize quinine as a treatment for malaria. In the process, he accidentally isolated Moab from coal tar, unleashing the colors that had held fast in this, in this sludge of energy. Little did he know, this would come to be called aniline and would be the base of a synthetic color revolution, as well as the origins of almost all chemical and petrochemical companies. Turning coal tar into color was far more rewarding than any alchemist could have dreamt, providing the means by which the, coal, the world could be repainted. Coal tar's darkness, as Esther Leslie claims, was the origin of a color rush. The rainbow could be extracted from the mine rather than the colony. And a seemingly new world order began in which pigment took hold at a molecular level. The color industry reached its explorative heights in Nazi Germany when ACFA, Bas, Bayer, and other coal derivative companies consolidated into IG Farben, Farben meaning colors in German, um, and instrumental to and the instrument of Hitler's regime, IG Farben created everything from dyes to paints to food colorings. Using slave labor from concentration camps, it revolutionized the standardization and commodification of color while also manufacturing Cyclone B, the deadly poison for the gas chambers. Since the advent of industrialism, color has been moving. It fades and is fed, but it also morphs and changes, signaling environmental shifts. The most famous interspecies toxic class struggle of the 19th century is that of the moth. As factories rose between London and Manchester, both town and country darkened. Walls and streets were blackened, and the white lichen on the bark of trees on which white moth lurked faded. Formerly camouflaged, they became easy prey, and a rarer kind of moth with black spots of melanin took their niche. By 1848, fully black specimens had become a common enough sight in Manchester that they were classified as their own species. Opposed to the white-bodied, the typica, the normal, the black-bodied moth was named Carbonaria, as if carried by the billowing plumes and chimneys and smokestacks, carbon gave itself to another form, animating carbon color, and by the end of the century, Carbonaria moth almost twice outnumbered typica. The struggle of the peppered moth signaled an eco-chemical crisis. The moth mothed into atmospheric pollution. Industrialism, an unprecedented release of energy into new systems, classifies. It counts, groups, and naturalizes differences that emerge as environments transform. Classification depicts the new in the context of the existing. It domesticates and depoliticizes the struggle of adaptation. Like wilderness, it organizes life into a static image. The irony is, we cannot imagine a species removed from its color because we taxonomize at least at first visually. <clears throat> like moths, moth in moth, pigeons with darker feathers are now reproducing faster than their lighter fellows. They pigeon, pigeon. Melanin is a um, pigment and protection. Um, so they draw the ions of toxic trace metals from their bodies to their pinion. Zinc and sometimes lead deposited in um, 
in their wings actually color coordinates them with their urban environment. And even after death, birds keep atmospheric toxins in their feathers, and we can read the composition of urban air in the way feathers feather toxin. Ornithologists also along the east coast of the US have noticed that some yellow feathered birds have begun to mold crimson. Like the salmon sparrow in sky, their body color and their species color no longer align. As temperatures rise in the area, plant life has adapted and new red honeysuckle berries now proliferate. So when woodpeckers and waxwings feed on these once uncommon fruit, they metabolize a new pigment um, that alters the color of their feathers. So we could say that when yellow woodpeckers feather invasive berry, we can tell that berries are turning rising temperature. Color then no longer flows through bodies, but rather is bodies flowing through color. In our post-industrial era, the amount of toxic substances circulating through bodies is such, Hannah Landricker notes, that bodies are actually the ones circulating through chemicals, not the other way around. Likewise, instead of bodies metabolizing color, it appears color is metabolizing bodies. A bright pink foam of lead, cadmium, nickel, and mercury runs into India's Yamuna River from textile factories. This runoff leaches into the soil, warming up roots and making the vegetables that grow in fields nearby taste fast fashion. Fast fashion then flows from the river to the plants, to the textile worker who eat them and back out again. In Mumbai, fast fashion metabolized 11 dog bodies, strays who swam in the Kasadi River to cool down amidst the summer heat and then turn cyan blue. As low cost fast fashion producers concentrate their facilities in countries with cheap labor and lax environmental regulations, it is not uncommon to see rivers running trendy seasonal colors. And so the dogs that swim in must wear color rivers become must wear color dogs. Red Hook in Brooklyn had an incredibly hot summer in 2010. Flowers and blossoms withered and hives in the area began to glow incandescent red. It seemed that starving bees had resorted to non-floral food sources. As the Brooklyn bees fed on cherry syrup from a nearby factory, red 40 petrochemical colorant metabolized bees, honey and hive. At the ends of the earth, chromatmospheres show signs of a new bipolar order. In the Arctic, air losing transparency due to suspended chemicals distorting the trajectory of sunlight is a snow. Ocean water pollutants accumulated in fat erodes the skin of white seals, causing fading. What seems like orange snow rust is actually parasites thriving in rising polar temperatures. So the Arctic does not Arctic, Arctic white any longer. Flamingos raised in captivity lack access to astasan rich algae. So zoos feed them flamingo to keep up with visitors' expectations. Just as farmed salmon, 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 flamingo, flamingos, flamingo. Farmed salmon, in the meantime, the algae that gives flamingos their distinctive salmon color are the latest wonder ingredient in human beauty products. You can now flamingo your skin, hair, and nails. Our skin biologically protects us while exposing us to the politics of perception, shifting with the popularity and decay of skin bleaching and tanning products. The perception of skin tones have changed over time, showing the unstable relationship between class and race, as well as the human obsession with bodily appearance. Tanning gummy bears allow now light-skinned humans to metabolize the color of the sun without sitting under it. They are just another wave of food supplements to alter skin from the inside out. Bodies have become filtering devices. Humans and animals are disposable hosts of synthetic color. Humans struggle to imagine a species detached from its color, even when we are the ones who detach it. Shifting cues in flesh, scales, skin, and feathers are clues to the metabolic metamorphosis around and inside us. Life in this chromatmosphere denies salmon the right to their own colors. 
as diets and desires transform plant and animal bodies, we need to learn the struggle of living with and within color. After all, we color the chromatmosphere and the world is already saturated. Salmon, therefore, is the color of a wild fish that is neither wild, nor fish, nor even salmon. After decades of overfishing and exhaustive salmon farming and color leaks, Sky's waters have reached a point where seasonal productivity, ecology, and employment then need to be rethought. Food seasons as we know them have ceased to exist. When we walk down the supermarket today and we kind of choose our products, we're encountered by tomatoes in the winter, oranges in the summer, and salmon every day of the year. What are the new seasons according to which we could eat today? So <clears throat> what we've been doing with Climavore is to explore precisely how to eat as humans are changing climates or how to live as humans in changing clim climates uh, by looking at new seasons that are appearing. Uh, so what would it mean to, to eat in a period of drought, in a period of uh, desertification, in a period of polluted ocean by uh, salmon farms and, and the one of the main iterations of the project is located in the Isle of Skye in Scotland, where we've been dealing a lot with this salmon farm pollution, not only with the colors and all these kind of side effects that we were just talking about, but also how to use the, the tidal zone um, through for another imaginary of the coast. So the idea of the climavore, that today one doesn't need to be omnivore, locavore, omnivore, carnivore, vegetarian or vegan, but how do we actually adapt the way we eat and our desire to food according to the climate emergency and the events that we are inducing on the planet? And in order to do that, we've been working on alternative ecologies and economies and other systems, basically how to transition a whole island away from salmon farming, which is kind of the predominant um, industry there. To do that, we've been working with um, fellow creatures, uh, mainly uh, oysters, mussels, um, mollusks, bivalves, uh, but also uh, seaweeds. They clean the water as they grow, as you can see here, a tank with oysters and without oysters. And they've been also very present in Scottish diet for centuries, or if not millennia, um, but they've been a bit forgotten over the past uh, decades. So all of these ingredients, basically, such as oysters, that could filter up to 130 liters of water per day, a single oyster, have been a very important kind of staple of the diet and of coastal kind of ec communities and uh, ecologies for many, many centuries. And kind of through the project, basically, we started to look into the histories, how they were both used in for instance, to create explosives during the Napoleonic War, how some of the first kind of com common um, legal kind of statues basically to use the intertidal zone was instated in Jersey already back in the 16th century as a way to control the usership of the island and how also in many cases kind of communities that were kind of living with the coast also had very matriarchal um, ways of living when women were really at the center of these fishing economies. So the, the tidal zone has a very rich history from these fish traps that uh, you can still find, these kind of ancestral structures to, to, to live with the coast, uh, to the different social histories of yeah, forms of organization, labor, and also uh, empowerment through the act of living like on the edge. Many times people were pushed to the edge because of the clearances, but then also there's a whole history of um, yeah, emancipation, let's say, by living with the sea that was many times um, erased. And um, what we've been working out is also how to think of these tidal zone models, looking at different examples and case studies from other parts of the world to precisely bring back some of these cultural components that could reimagine um, new forms of, of eating through these kind of oysters, mussels, seaweeds, etc. And after we did kind of the first, uh, after studying all of these um, examples, basically the first thing we did is build our, our own oyster table, basically a home 
for oysters, mussels, and seaweeds that all filter the water as they grow. This table exists in the intertidal zone, and every day at high tide, basically, all of the creatures within it are filtering the water. And then at low tide, this table emerges above the sea and becomes a table where we put some humans. And over a course of several events, dinners, and meals, uh, we brought together local politicians activists and uh, environmentalists and scientists basically to discuss alternative aquacultures for the coast. As part of the that kind of cultural shift, what we've been doing also over the past years is to collaborate with restaurants, uh, first on the island, restaurants that um, remove farmed salmon from their menu and introduce uh, dishes with uh, these climate ingredients. Um, and for us, the, the role of the restaurant is, is really important. We like to go back to the kind of French uh, etymology of restaurant, restaurant. And actually, the word in modern times comes from places called Bouillon Restaurant, which were places in Paris where you could um, have a warm soup, uh, a bouillon, to restore your body or to warm up the body. And for us, we, we like to see the agency of the restaurant no longer as something that can restore your body or your health or human health, but a place where we could think of ways to restore ecology at large. So when kind of after working in Sky for a few years and collaborating with restaurants, when we were invited um, a couple of years ago to do an exhibition at Tate, the main accent for the exhibition, apart from telling all of these stories about color and kind of the erosion of color in the chrome atmosphere, was to work with Tate to remove salmon off their menus throughout their four museums uh, in England and Cornwall. And then from there, we kind of expanded that and started working also with the Serpentine. And when we were nominated for the Turner Prize, we basically enacted a nationwide campaign where we worked with 22 restaurants all over the country mm -hmm and 11 restaurants in Sky, basically to remove salmon and introduce a climb over dish. So how do we kind of, by this removal of these extractive um, food ingredients and their replacement with foods that are more regenerative, we can start kind of thinking about the agency of both kind of restaurants, but also of kind of the choices that food establishment make in order to shape or reshape food infrastructure. Um, <coughs> th these also we created these postcards that we distributed all over the country and people could go and collect this 12 part poster um, there is also like a like a, a website for your phone if you want to see also parts of the exhibition and more information that people could look at um, and that also then expanded into Italy like like how do we continue that those collaborations with museums in other uh, places uh, so this was part of the campaign that we launched um, also very recently in at Pala Expo in Rome, uh, where we are working to, um, yeah, not only with Pala Expo to become climavore, but also uh, other kind of networks um, within the country. And under this kind of guise and framework, basically on the Isle of Sky, we've been developing the climavore station, which is operates under three streams, which are learning, growing, and building. So under learning, basically, we're developing a series of workshops and to enhance and build skills within the local community. We ran for two years uh, until pretty, yeah, and the first year until the first year of the pandemic, um, an apprenticeship course in the local high school where people are training to become cooks and basically created a special workshop of teaching students how to become climavore cooks and learning basically bring local chefs and foragers and muscle growers, scallop drivers, etc., to teach the students basically how to use these ingredients. And then the graduates of this course basically got a paid apprenticeship in one of the restaurants that we were working with. Um, there are many, many activities. We'll just mention a few. We can expand during the Q&A if you want. Um, so we did this kind of also postcards to work with uh, elderly homes on the island to collect memories from the coast. Um, but then also within the growing part of the, of the project is the development of these alternative farms that we've been working on with marine scientists to, to grow many species at a time. So not to only grow food, but cultivate habitats as an ecology. And we've been doing the first tests 
um, in three parts of Sky, working with different community trusts to develop this community-owned model or to rethink the usership of the coast from a collective perspective as the Tidal Commons, which is a framework we're putting together that doesn't really exist in the UK. Um, and, and also working with local weavers to produce these seaweed and, and kind of natural fiber nets and ropes to test uh, which species attach to, to which surface best. So these are just images of the first prototypes. And then also in parallel, kind of we've been thinking a lot about the waste stream. So what happened with all of the shells that are consumed in the restaurants? And in the past um, year and a half now, we've been collecting all of these shells and basically transforming them into new material. And through a series of um, prototypes, basically are creating this oyster and mussel and scallop shell terrazzo, which is made out of a hundred well, not 100% shell because there's also water and other things in it, but it's 95 95% shell, um, and there's no um, and not using any cement. So basically, transforming the shell into lime and kind of creating from the slime a binding material, then kind of that produces this terrazzo, and that kind of also was based on a lot of research into these historical techniques in places like Taiwan um, that had this kind of very, very ancient technique of building um, with oyster shell and also the tabby concrete, which was something that was quite common both in Scotland and um, in the south of the US. So this also has been looking into different case studies of places and people that have been building from with materials from intertidal origin, like these uh, seagrass houses in Denmark or yeah, different places, the shells in China, etc. But also applying this to the construction course in the local high school um, in the sky as well. So we developed another building apprenticeship with uh, different techniques that we're trying to experiment with these shells and um, seaweed plastering and so on. And just to give it for us, it's also really interesting to think how these things get integrated and by, you know, over the time speaking to a lot of people. And today we just got an email from someone that is setting up like a series of uh, social housing projects all across the highlands that is really interested to integrate these materials into the building. And we are like very far from being able to like now furnish like hundreds of flats with like oyster terrazzo but i think the fact that like there's a certain interest in how then we can also use industry to kind of advance the project and kind of enlist more restaurants into the process etc for us is is something that is really um, interesting and so basically through these all of these metabolic interactions what we're looking for always is these spaces of opportunity for discussion or kind of reassembling the spatial construction of the ocean and its intertidal area. So how do we rethink coastal policy, facilitate small scale and independent initiatives and kind of really think about the landscape, uh, kind of the land ownership structures that are still very colonial in kind of their history and are governing a lot of the land in the UK and also kind of the approach to landscape management and ecology. Um, yeah, so we're going to leave it there, and I'm sure there are a few questions. <laughs> I'm a I was saying, we haven't, a, we haven't heard this in yes, two years. Is there is there nothing <laughs> compares yeah. to like on Zoom, just like nothing can compare to like an audience clapping. So thank you for that. Yeah, if you have any questions or you want to learn more about things that were not clear, um, or to expand, to. yeah, something to expand on. Yeah. There's a microphone in the back. I guess we need it for people that are watching us to hear. Uh, I'm deeply impressed. Actually, I'm a chef in Belgium. We meet each other uh, tomorrow, so uh, I'm really looking <laughs> forward. <laughs> but yeah, we just met. But <laughs> I have to I have to give a presentation myself in like 20 minutes in Mechelen, and it's 20 minutes drive. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm deeply impressed. Um, I support like working with local products. 
I only work with fish from the North Sea. Mm -hmm. um, good fish from local fishermen, not like uh, fish who is mm -hmm. created as yeah. some is created by color. Um, but I'm impressed by this artwork, this mm -hmm. presentation. It's 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 amazing, and I I will try to spread the word mm -hmm. together with you. Mm -hmm. um, It's, it's a story for me, food, food is my life. It's like a, the way I live, it's like from morning till night, it's all about food. And if you see what, what they are doing, not only with, with fish, or, but also with, with the vegetables, how they manipulate all those things, it's amazing, it's crazy actually, and we just accept it. We just accept it and we, we, we don't think, we, we are like cheeps. <laughs> It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm really deeply impressed, and I hope to talk for hours <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. you know, but it's, it's, yeah, it's exactly what, what you were saying is like that many times we, we forget, right? Like, oh, the things should be tasty, and we take for granted that they are not. Um, and how to, that's what we've been trying to do with restaurants um, in Sky and different places to, to experiment with things like. Yeah, how do we think of some of these ingredients also as active agents for regeneration of the landscape? Um, not only having nutritional value, but also how do they have nutritional value for the soil or for the water or for other species living with them while they grow? Yeah. I think also w w you have a vision, I have a vision uh, about food, and you want to change something, um, me as well, we as well, because it's my, my right hand. Uh, we want to change something and people they ask me sometimes um, why are you doing commercial things for supermarkets to give you an answer actually it's because i really want to change something and if you want to change you have to change it at the table at the people uh, in, in the in the kitchens at home i think um, what you're doing like um, sharing the project or the the, the the, the vision with, with uh, chefs, with, with great chefs. I think it's, it's the key. It's the key because people are, are making recipes of them, they are follow, following them. But also the really corrupt supermarkets, we should, we should change their, their, their vision. And I think that's the, exactly the reason why I'm working for a, uh, a brand like Deleuze, actually it's it's mafia, but <laughs> I really want to change their vision. Uh, so keep on the good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> so I have a question. You uh, had a list. Can you hear me? Does it? Yeah, is it's working. Do you mind standing up? Yes, 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 of yes, course. You. Um, you showed a list of restaurants who, basically, you convinced to to cancel the salmon. So my question is, how do you go about? You sent them all a mail. Like, are you interested I in wish, our lecture, or how how does this work? Yeah. Because I'm interested in how you approach them yeah. with yeah. Uh, what you have to say. No, it's a great great question. So uh, the the beginning was in Sky, and we worked with 10 restaurants from 2017, and there we approached about 40, and Sky, I mean, it's quite a big island, but it's still, it's an island community, and there's like about 40 restaurants, and people, you know, we work with a group of local people that we were invited originally by a local arts organization and also we continue to work with people that are based on the island and basically are running kind of all of the climb of our work in sky and we yeah i mean in the beginning we just like started like sending emails calling setting up meetings going to talk to these chefs explaining like what we're doing and and also i think it's important to say that like there were a few chefs that were already on board i don't know if they were like actively not like putting salmon on the menu but it was something that was on their conscience there was like 
one restaurant that was like very against salmon, but then for instance, their building burnt down 10 years ago and they put it back because it's a very cheap kind of product that like everyone wants and everyone eats and it's a really good way to make quick money. Um, and that kind of reinvigorated kind of their, you know, participation in, in this struggle. And so that was like the beginning. Then with Tate, it was again, I mean, the moment we were kind of invited to do the exhibition, we were like, okay, the exhibition is Tate removing salmon. And we were, th there's, if Tate doesn't remove salmon, there's no exhibition, right? That was kind of the equation. And of course, this is really simplifying a process that took like a year and a half to get there. And the pandemic in the middle that like made things like really complicated again, because everyone wanted like quick turnaround and like quick profit. So that was like just many, many conversations and negotiations. Um, and then <coughs> for the Turner Prize, we through the, like we start working with Serpentine and the Serpentine works with a company that kind of basically manages many cafes in many restaurants all over like the UK. And the moment we kind of got them on board, it was a way to kind of spread the message. And I think also for us, that's really, there's a whole process of like upscaling, right? Like how do you start with like a few restaurants that are independent, how you go then to like a museum that runs like a corporate kind of style kitchen. And then how do you like go into a corporation and like, what does it mean to actually start, you know, in the same way that was commented before about supermarkets, like these infrastructure, like we're very firm supporters of like, local, you know, artisan kind of approaches to growing and distributing food. But we cannot, like, the problems of the food industry are, like, not there. And there's huge questions also who has like, access to these kind of types of food, right? And at the end of the day, for, like, many, many reasons, which could be, like, a whole, like, two-hour discussion and lecture now, people don't have access to that. And therefore, like, how do we start kind of taking these ideas and kind of bringing them places like the supermarkets and under which conditions? For us, it's a really important question. So that in a way is kind of the process and I think can indicate a bit also the direction the project is going while continuing to keep doing this kind of very localized work. But if you were now Let's say if you had the ambition, like to continue the conversation from before to um, make, let's say, Del has changed their policy. What would your approach be? So, do you try to do you rely on the new the how would I say the message spreading from small parts into something big, or would you consider trying different approaches? I like, what do you think it's possible there? I think we try to do everything to to do both at at <laughs> everything to <laughs> to <laughs> to do like to collaborate with a very small independent people. So we were collaborating with a, a food truck that was serving like selling bowls of soup for like two euros to these Michelin star restaurants and also this very this like, this um very and with <laughs> hello hello and with more corporate structures. So I don't think it's either or, I think it's to, to, to work with both in parallel because it's very different audiences, very different uh, outreach, and some can take certain risks and other can take, others can take other risks. But everything so, is also, yeah. it's part of the same system, yeah. right? And you cannot, they feed into each other, like the hyper-local farmer market, yada, 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 and kind of the big super, right? They, completely kind of live on in each other and they need each other. So it's like we look at it in a kind of quite ecosystemic way. There was yeah, a question here. Fun lecture. Um, um, the way I understand you understand that your interventions kind of exist on the supply chain, 
of these products, so in the farming or production and distribution. And I was wondering, is there also ways to enable consumers or to give them more agency to change the, the way what products are pro produced and what yeah. we consume? I don't know. Should we demand to eat green oranges, for instance? Yeah. Or yeah. What should we do? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's a it's super, super important question, and we think a lot, a lot about this. I think, um, and maybe it's kind of yes, like. The straight answer is yes, I think consumers do have an agency. But I think we're also living at an age that consumers are are being given constantly more and more agency by corporations in order to entice them to consume more and more. And what does that has made is the fact that, you know, when you go today into a supermarket, it's like don't know how you feel about it, but in many ways we think about it as like an ethical bat like battleground, right? Like, am I going to buy the organic? Is it going to be the fair trade? Is it going to be the thing that's grown like five miles from here? Or am I going to buy, you know? And it's, for us, there's like a really fundamental question. Like, why are we not walking into a supermarket or a restaurant and knowing that everything in there is good for us and good for the environment? And no. you don't need to pay three times as much. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's a question of, it's a structural question. And of course, consumers have the power to influence that. But, you know, I think like even if you, yeah, it, it's, it's how do you actually, like how do you change the system? And I think the, the system is held in like very kind of small concentrations of power, right? And, and, and you can see it even with, like companies that I think, like Oatly, for instance, right, that is like has done an incredible campaign for like the reduction of like using like cow's milk or animal kind of based milk Wait, products, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and the reduction of it. Yet, kind of the way it's kind of growing and the way it's acting, right, is still acting as like any massive corporation in the world, right, and kind of the investment that they're taking from like hedge funds like BlackRock, et cetera, et cetera, like is not, for, like in, I think in our perspective, it's not a systemic change. It's kind of replacing like one thing with another that like can very easily start replicating the same issues, you know, if like now huge amounts of like land will be like bought just to like grow oats and oats and oats and oats is like, well, it might be not a pro big as, like cattle, but it still can become a huge problem. And to answer the question, what to do? There is no single recipe. What to do? Um, <laughs> sorry, um, but what we try to do is to use first, first to to know what's going on in the area where you live, like who are who is producing interesting things in interesting ways that you might want to consider engaging with, which is quite obvious, perhaps. Um, on the other hand is as practitioners within the visual arts or whatever fields you are working in, um, how to use the agency of culture, that's something we enjoy a lot, how to use that agency within museums or exhibitions or, or this kind of more cultural sphere with certain mediatic um, impact to, to do things. And, and for, I don't know, for us with, with Tate, it, it was quite exciting. It was a big headache of a year and a half but the fact that, that we wanted to change the restaurant and that was a non-negotiable with the exhibition, it, it did work to a certain degree. Um, yeah, so, and that's what we've been doing more and more with different cultural spaces, how if we really, if the system is broken, how to use culture to reimagine that system and put pressure uh, from multiple ways. And of course, it's not going to change the world, but, uh, people that were going to Tate or these other museums all of a sudden perhaps started thinking about things a bit differently. Okay, thank you. Oh, I have a question for the menus. Is the absence of the salmon on the menu presented somehow? Or is it just not there uh, anymore? Yeah. yeah, there's, um, well, it always says that there's like, a, it's a climb of dish and then kind of there's an explanation of what is climb of at the bottom of the menu and it kind of explained that these ingredients or dishes are replacing kind of farmed salmon dishes, etc. Thank you. 
The lecture was gorgeous, really Thank gorgeous. You. Thank you. Um, and I also think the knowledge that you guys acquired is amazing, and some of the techniques. And I was just thinking, where did you find these small, old practices and techniques? Were there people on the island that yeah. perhaps helped you, already had yeah. that knowledge, and it was? Yeah. yeah. Um, you're talking specifically, like, for instance, with the with the tiles and things like that, or the stories with knowing with, when you're building the benches, knowing what yeah. sort of yeah. ecosystem you're yeah. working. Yeah. With. Yeah. So um, but many many sources. Some are um, some are uh, more. Yeah, as you were saying, just speaking to people or local archives or like yeah, all kinds of people on the island or other places. Um, we've been doing research in different yeah case studies and also using again exhibitions to to connect to other forms of knowledge so for instance we showed some images of Taiwan that we did a project there and and there the technique is literally instead of using cement they cook oysters with rice and sugar and this is old technique and then that gets almost like glue becomes glue and they use it to lay bricks and that's been going on there for 200 years um, or five yeah um, many <laughs> Um, so, so yeah. How do you start learning from these experiences? And then, in terms of material research, we work with two fabricators there in Sky, and they've been testing like this works, it doesn't work. Trial and error, like any process. Uh, and the more kind of historic cases is yeah, talking to people, archives, uh, yeah. And it's a mix of sources. Yeah, and I think also like and and maybe kind of to answer it from a more methodological kind of approach as well, and I think one of the key things that is really important for us is what does it mean to commit to like a project for like a really long time, right? And 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 I think especially now that there's like such a drive, <laughs> um, I think especially now when like I think there's such an urge kind of in the cultural sphere to like discuss ecology and like everyone wants like exhibitions about ecology and all the museums wants to reflect about the climate emergency, which is super important and we're like a hundred percent behind it, right? But like at the same time, we're like if we acknowledge that we're living in a moment of crisis, like we have to kind of how do we shift from talking about something to actually doing something? And the moment you start thinking about practicing ecology, you very quickly, I think, are confronted with the situation that you doing ecology is not something that like lasts in the duration of like three months exhibition. Like remediating a plot of land that like has been like polluted for like two hundred years because of like whatever happened there can take like easily two hundred years. And like, what does it mean to do a project for two, for 200 years? And more than kind of the infrastructural kind of question of like, how do you get institutions to support you for 200 years, which is like a whole discussion. How do you keep yourself interested in the same thing for like 200 years, right? Or like 50, let's say. Um, or 30, maybe. Or 30. <laughs> and, and, but I think like for us, that's, there's something really fundamental in there, like, and and how can you constantly be kind of going back, you know, to the same thing, like, and and what does it mean to kind of, you know, talk about salmon for like ten years, like over and over and over and over again. I mean, sorry uh, for us, you know, it's like, <laughs> like you hear it for the first time. Um, so. And so I think there's like, and in a way, I think kind of finding all of these like histories, techniques, kind of, and kind of unraveling kind of what has been there and how do you kind of can use that, kind of rely on that in order to think about the soup, like a certain future, I think just becomes like a methodology that we've been using a lot. Uh, I was oh, I was generally wondering about uh, the team that surrounds you guys or whether you guys are doing it completely alone and also about the thing that you guys were talking about in the beginning um, of sort of um, creating a way um, of new seasons 
uh, and if you have more information about that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the first question, yeah, no, on our own, impossible. So we have a, a team, it's very small, it grows. Um, so we, in the studio, we have Rosa and Remy in London. Then in Sky, we have Shona and Caroline that have been kind of dealing more with all these kind of <coughs> activities of with learning and like coordination of all the programs and uh, speaking to all the different people, the collaborations with restaurants, etc. Uh, then uh, and then you and and Martin that are more in charge of the fabrication also in in, in Sky, uh, and then we have Danny um, that she's kind of overseeing. She is the director of care. Pictures. Yeah, <laughs> we have a director of care, Danny Burrows. She's great, and and she makes sure that things are done. Uh, care. care, yeah, and and to the second question um, with the seasons. Um, yes, so what, you wanted to know exactly how they work, or one by one, or what are they? About, yeah. yeah. There is like some sort of a, like a beautiful guide, mm. or like yeah. a... Yes, so what, you can check on the Climb Over website, you yeah. you can find, and it's organized according to seasons, yeah, so... Like yes. yes, so this was, what we explained tonight was one season, let's say, which is polluted oceans uh, by salmon farms or fish farms. Then there is a whole season of desertification or movement of deserts. Then another one of drought. Um, and then how to, how to, basically it's all about creating in those two cases, those two seasons, creating microclimates to water without water or to water without, without, with the stones um, through different microclimatic conditions that reduce water stress uh, from plants. Um, and then now we like soil erosion. And basically, I mean, it's kind of at the moment, it's structured around that each kind of season revolves around the project or a few projects. And we kind of use the project as a way to kind of unpack kind of these new seasons. I think, like, hopefully next year we are hoping to have time to kind of delve a bit deeper, kind of into let's say the bigger questions of these seasons and how to frame them a bit better. So hopefully there'll be more on that um, soon. Does this work? Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, thank you for your colorful lecture. Um, I was wondering how your conversations with producers and uh, farmers actually go. Is, do you encounter uh, reluctance to the models that you propose? Is there, um, um, how does this conversation go and how do you convince producers to actually change their way of working and not maybe tap into the industrial way of working, but uh, do they see what you propose as a viable alternative, and how do you convince them of yeah. this? Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. It depends. Um, I think, <laughs> no, it, it depends, because I think it's a, I mean, it's a very important question, and I think there's, there are some industries that, let's say, cannot be saved, right, and shouldn't be saved, and I don't think, you know, like, farmed salmon is is not something that should continue like full stop and yes in the theoretical level and there are kind of all of these experiments now to grow them in closed tanks etc etc but i i really doubt that's ever going to become viable then so i think those guys they don't like us at all <laughs> And we have been getting like a lot of like pushback in different ways, a, but a as well. I mean, mostly museums, not directly at us, but like museums and we have been getting a lot, a lot of pushback. Then in with other kind of farmers that they think there's like possibilities to kind of do things differently and their histories of doing things differently. And let's say just in the past, like 17 years, 70 years, we started doing things in like really, really bad and wrong ways. I think there you have like already people that are doing like incredible things. And I think then many times our project comes and tries to kind of elevate that or kind of how to 
use the work that is being done and kind of build on that and kind of highlight the work rather than kind of in like inventing it. And I think also that enables a more of a kind of collective force to bring like more people on board. But I think in in the case of Skype specifically, I think, you know, we're working now with three different communities to set up kind of three these three intertidal polyculture farm models, which will start their trial hopefully like at the end of March. And there's a big there is a big appetite to that, even though, you know, everyone knows someone that like grows, like that works, sorry, in a salmon farm. And it's a very small community and the ties are, you know, it's like, it's there everywhere you kind of turn your head. But yet I think people also understand like what's going on and what are the effects of it. And also because the issue is always that these big corporate industrial f infrastructures, they provide jobs, but also the kind of jobs they provide are a bit questionable. And also people don't necessarily want to have those jobs. And what's been interesting also in the past year is that we were approached by two um, young men that were used to work for a salmon farm and they don't want to work for, well, the summer farm closed and they don't want to go into another summer farm. And they were like, we are desperate to use our skills in a way that, because they, they have a lot of skills of working at sea, also before as fishermen or as divers. Um, and, and how do we use that to grow foods or different foods and different ways? So then they are the ones that are like, we want to do something else. We not, don't have the final answer yet, but it's a, joint exploration like how do we how do we do that and how do we use the project also to support those initiatives that people really want to to push so we're not really convincing anyone is that we well, what everyone kind of not everyone but many people agrees uh, agree is that there needs to be something else and, and what something else looks like is uh, yeah to be determined Hi, thanks for, the, thanks for the lecture. Um, I was wondering if you have an opinion on aquaponicos. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah, just yes. as a question. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> we do. Um, <laughs> yes. I think, <laughs> how to put it lightly. Um, I think for, for, well, I'll say something larger than aquaponics. I think the whole kind of, process of like making food more and more high tech for me it's a it's a huge raises a lot of like red flags basically um because it's kind of the notion that like which is kind of the history of industrialism every problem we'll have we'll just solve it with like a bit more technology right and then we create a problem that we solve like with just a bit more technology and then just like a bit more technology and the kind of the risk I think I see that I think we're at the moment that from our perspective and kind of the ethos behind climavores, like how do we bring people to be more in contact with the environment? And and I think all of this kind of process of kind of technology like like hyper kind of high tech food industry is kind of doing exactly the opposite. So I'm just worried that if kind of we now do this like huge drive towards up aquaponics, what happens to the soil? Like who takes care of the soil? And soil is something that has developed like over thousands of years together with humans, not like separated. And there are again many theories of how soil fertility is tightly linked to people that were kind of working the soil. And yeah, what does it, you know, like, can we kind of completely divorce ourselves from soil? I'm not 100% sure about that. But also not only soil, but also the whole water system. And there's been ancestral methods to grow fish and plants and agriculture all together in these cycles. But that had a very different scale and very different logic to the moment when you start doing that high tech levels, like in big industrial facilities. 
Um, and the same with lab grown meat and 3D printed meat and all these things that perhaps from a technological point of view are interesting, but we think that they do not address the broken system. So it's not, we don't think there is a problem of not having enough food to feed the world, which is always the claim. It's more like how is that not distributed properly, how much food waste there is, et cetera, et cetera. Who is really taking advantage of, of the production, of food production? So with all these new, new, old, new technologies, we think that the broken system is not addressed. So how do we actually understand first the whole ecological cycle um, to understand all the stakeholders and then think about what possible solutions there could be? Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for this beautiful presentation and your very positive and energy and all the yeah good ideas you're bringing to this room tonight. I have a question about the factor of time because, as you mentioned before, it takes decades and centuries to really establish change and, and new mechanisms and, and, and yeah, there's just a lot of patience needed, but on the other side, there's this sense of urgency and of fear and of emergency and of like time running out. So how do you make, make that match for yourselves and how do you not feel over, overwhelmed by, yeah, by the stress level if you think about all these issues? <laughs> we, we do feel overwhelmed. Yes. yes. Um, um, but I think, it, yeah, I think it's like just operating in different temporalities and kind of also things, you know, each project that lasts for 50 years has is built out of many stages. And you kind of think about, on the one hand, yes, you're kind of thinking 10 years ahead, maybe. And at the same time, you're also thinking of like what has to happen, like, tomorrow and, and this week and everything you didn't manage to do yesterday. Um, and I think this is kind of, yeah, the the art of living in precarious times that I think we're all practicing um, constantly. And, and I think, yeah, and I don't know if it's a good thing, but I think somehow we kind of trained ourselves to uh, accept that. So, that that I think is like on a more personal level. And then I think on the level of the project, I think we are constantly looking for opportunities of like how to mobilize, right? And that's whether it's on the work with Sky, whether it's with museums, and that is like, how do we mobilize the media, et cetera, right? And it's, it's this is the how the process kind of grows and, and changes and is as essential. Like it's not that there's like a goal of like, what is it going to look like in 40 years and like we're just like working towards that it's like no there's like how do we every exhibition you know like every opportunity every exhibition every lecture every like place we visit is an opportunity to to do something to like influence someone to change something thank you hola um what about the young generations? Are you directly guys sharing this information with young people? Or are you planning to invite young people to these dinner tables? And how are you approaching that in this moment? I don't ever talk about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, yes, they, there's a lot of, we've been doing a lot of things with, <laughs> with, with the school children um, and the schools, especially at the table, uh, it was also part of the, the whole kind of learning process. In, and that's why for us, the apprenticeships were also very important. Um, so to start training the next generation of cooks on the island that were 15, 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, and what was quite surprising sometimes that even if they live on the island very close to the water, they've grown up there, Many have never eaten an oyster or, or eaten seaweed because it's slimy and ugh. so it was quite quite incredible. Other some are like really into that, and others never tried. 
Um, so even just those kind of workshops we're doing with local kind of chefs going to the school and, and teaching them how to cook seaweed or, or shark an oyster was quite kind of revealing for them. Um, some didn't like it at all, of course, but others were quite excited about the possibilities of all of a sudden having free food all around you that they had never considered and instead would go to the supermarket um, and buy expensive processed foods. So yeah, for us it's, it's, it's super important, the whole pedagogical framework um, to train the next generation. Not necessarily to train, but also to at least that they know that there are other options and then they can decide what to do. Gracias. Hi. Um, I was wondering um, if the Isle of Skye is a place where you grew up or what is your connection to it actually? Do you live there? Because I often see a small uh, village and then I wonder yeah. Yeah. where is are you situated? Um, no. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, no. We were based in London. We were invited there for the first time back in 2016 by an organization called Atlas Arts. Yeah. And basically, they commissioned from us a project, which was the oyster table that we showed. And since then, the project has been growing. And we opened basically a small organization on the island, which has like, yeah, employs kind of a few people there. And they kind of basically, there's a whole team on the island that's running all of the activities. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.